Oh yeah, absolutely. That's fine. For sure. For sure. It's Do fine. You um, he'll he'll stay up here. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, he won't even know. But you don't. You probably don't want to put it somewhere where he might accidentally grab it. How about like up there? Is that would it work up there? Yeah. See. Something like that. It won't have interference with this stuff. Okay, well if you need to move it, you can come, you can move it right before. Yeah, I don't think that, I just, he doesn't, he doesn't really know how to use computers very well, so I didn't want him to think it was the pointer and grab it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Don't worry about it. Good evening. Is this on, Wendy? Hello? On? Yeah. Good evening. Welcome to SciArc. Once upon a time, in the city of Chicago, Stanley Tigerman designed a library for the blind and the handicapped. Two elevations were plastered. And the third side of the triangular plan was a poured concrete wall, 250 feet long, 20 feet high. I'm guessing the dimensions, I don't remember, so you correct me if I'm in error. 250 feet long and 20 feet wide, punctured by an elongated glazed opening with a cosine curving head. No? Can you hear me? Should I go? Yeah. Much better. Go again. 
or not worth hearing again. <laughs> Self-effacing, as always. I'll do it again. Uh, once upon a time, in the city of Chicago, Stanley Tigerman designed a library for the blind and the handicapped. Two elevations were plastered, and the third side of the triangular plan was a poured concrete wall, 250 feet long and 20 feet high, punctured by an elongated glazed opening with a cosine curving head. According to Tigerman, Mayor Daly signed on to provide the extra cash to construct the wall in a single pour. So the wall was poured, the forms were stripped, Tigerman took a look, couldn't stomach the result, rejected same, and painted the wall gray. Stanley Tigerman grew up as a technical virtuoso, an inheritor of a form language passed along from Marcel Lodes, John Prouvé, 860 Lakeshore Drive, Yale and Rudolph, and that ubiquitous 100-year pedigree of Chicago construction experiments. But suddenly, instead of ratifying Chicago architecture's mid-20th century techno pro forma, Stanley disowned it and painted the wall. That painted decision may seem insignificant in today's discourse, but at the time it was a radical conceptual choice. By painting a 250-foot-long hunk of single-pore board form concrete, Stanley challenged a governing structural material tenant of modern architecture. And Stanley has been one of architecture's agnostics ever since. I remember sitting on a jury surrounded by the usual esoteric commentary and Stanley turned to the group and announced, I get my lines from Chicago cab drivers. Somewhere between facetious and genuine, Stanley was admonishing his colleagues to drop what he considered to be the pretensions of that discussion and to move the debate to the more pragmatic constraints of the local street corner. In retrospect, the I learned from cabbies remark suggested yet another career course correction for Tigerman. From confirmed modernist to postmodern agnostic to street corner populist. Tigerman offered a seminar at the University of Illinois in which students were required to impersonate a renowned philosopher drawn from Stanley's list of accredited intellectuals. One learned student philosopher debated another, each arguing a conceptual position which somehow implicated architecture. During a studio critique one afternoon, Tigerman suddenly insisted that Mies van der Rohe was actually a classicist. I argued that Mies was a modernist, and in the long-established tradition of that studio, the student audience demanded a Tigerman-Moss debate. With Tigerman, there's never an event without the requisite pun a punishment and reward. Ergo, after each session, the audience vote designated a winner and loser of the debate. First came the tripartite, classically divided, high-rise Mies versus the hang the custom five by eight inch bronze eye section on the wall of Seagram Mies. Next, the freeform Friedrichstrasse Mies versus the bilaterally symmetrical Lakeshore Drive Mies, and so on. And then they voted. Over the last 30 years, the Tigerman persona has been one of the most provocative in world architecture. The Stanley Doctrine was never 
doctrinaire. Instead, it always seemed multiple, offering a perpetual tension between alternative points of view. The Yale highbrow and the street corner cabbie, the doctrinaire modernist and the postmodern agnostic, design ober alles and a populist conscience. There's an old Siegfried Gideon metaphor that imagines the history of architecture as a stream flowing from the past to the future. And the best an architect can ever do is to drop his boats into that stream and see what sinks and what floats forward. Uniquely among architects, Stanley has dropped a virtual flotilla into that stream. And it wouldn't be a surprise to see a number of those barges docked somewhere upriver, far into architecture's future. Please welcome Stanley Tigerman to Syrac. Well, it's great. Is it on? You think? Is it on? Can you hear me? It's off. It's on. Okay. It's been. It's great to be back. I haven't been here in a long time. Um, but Eric and I obviously go back a very long way. Um, I have to put something back. Uh, which doesn't mean that you want to believe anything he said, because it's, let's just say it's interpretive, okay? Um, but we go back a very long way, and I, as indeed I do with this institution, I first came here in 1976, five, six, or seven, when it was very young and in Santa Monica, which is two iterations ago. Um, and it was, incredibly refreshing at the time to see this operation begin in opposition and resistance to the conventions of architecture. I think what's even more interesting is to see it still, even as an accredited institution, in opposition to the, conven to the conventions of architectural education. Uh, witness the kind of kinds of people that have been here. Some of, not all, some of Eric's predecessors. Uh, some of its faculty, which doesn't mean that being rebellious is in and of itself uh, an end at, a, at some level. But just taking Eric as an example, to see his work, his pedagogical urges. I say that having brought him to Chicago to teach with me. Um, and to see the consonants, just in one person, uh, of what it is they say and what it is they do and their level of poetic discourse versus technological wherewithal, it's a pleasure. So I have a great deal of affection for Sayark, yet I'd love to say nothing about affection toward Eric. And at some level, not to overstate it, the school that I co-founded and am the director of in Chicago, Archie Works, has had six or seven people here, of four of whom, or five, are still here, one of whom just graduated. And it's, it's so interesting to me to see the trajectory of institutions as they evolve, as they grow old, as we all do. So this, this has retained its energy, uh, including its recent loss of a lawsuit. It still is here, and it still is out there at some level. So for me, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, probably one shouldn't give titles to talks. I, 
gave a title to this about ethics and morality in architecture, something I believe in sort of fiercely. But really, I'm going to show work in that context, to be sure, because I see, you know, the only thing you can count on, they used to say is death and taxes, but it's actually the delta. It's about change. And you, many people here, not only my advanced age, have gone through a number of isms and will continue to. Uh, but I think that ultimately uh, architecture has an ethical substance to, it, substance to it. Whether one builds or not, by the way, whether one just simply draws or not so simply, just draws, builds, teaches, uh, or the other opportunities available within the discipline. I never saw it as a business, I never saw it as a profession, I never saw it as aesthetic particularly, I certainly never saw it as arcane, uh, producing uh, uh, propaganda to persuade in terms of one view or another. But I've always, and it's in, been increasingly, seen it as ethical. So I love the way that SciArc began coming out of Pomona. You know, it has its own tragic history. Uh, Bernard Zimmerman comes to mind who actually structured the revolution, but then didn't come with it. And the whole tradition of the number of people, beginning with Shelley and Ray, and Michael and Neil, and now uh, Eric. And it still retains, almost ferociously protects, its individual autonomy. I, and that, in, that interests me a great deal. So this is about ethics, but it's, also about who I am. So I'm not showing very many projects, actually three or four with two or three slides each, and then only two projects with a lot of slides, a, a lot of images. Obviously I say slides because of my age, and I didn't, this is my first time trying to operate some PowerPoint thing. I didn't do any of this. One of the kids in our office did. I didn't because I don't know how to do that. Um, but the uh, Throughout all of this, I'm going to ref allude, if not directly refer, to an ethic, uh, ethical, substantive approach to architecture, which I genuinely believe in. I see architecture more as a calling, as a discipline. Some of you may remember in Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose, he describes Cistercian monks in Melk in Austria in the 12th century trying to copy the Bible before the Gutenberg Press and they can't do it, they always err. You always make mistakes. But they had a calling, and they sit there and do it anyway. And it's like practicing the piano. When they say practicing architecture, it means to practice it, and those that don't do it uh, lose that edge. For example, coincidental with my being here, and a lecture coming up in a couple weeks, I understand it, uh, and the exhibition down the hall is a Pafford Keating Clay. I worked with Pafford at Skidmore and Merrill literally 50 years ago. And Pafford is, no matter what else, um, the kind of person who really is, who sees this as a passionate pursuit. Not exactly a team player, but one who I recall when we were at Skidmore, his doing by himself, solely, as a solo, the Harris Trust building in Chicago, Clark and Monroe which is a huge building. He designed it, he did the details, he superintended, superintended, not supervised. Did the shop drawings, did the whole nine yards. You know him perhaps better at that school in San Francisco and a much more a Corbusian bent, but it was that focus that he had, which is the tradition of architecture. My wife has it, I don't. I mean, I really had no business becoming an architect because I have much to short an attention span and too low a threshold of pain. I need to be entertained and uh, gratified almost, it seems, at every moment. Nonetheless, punctuating each of these projects is, are drawings like this. I draw like this. They're done sometimes in foresight, sometimes in hindsight. They're often retrospective, and they're always surrealistic. But they actually, I mean, one's mind 
you know, like everybody else in every field, uh, architects are not cookie cutters. Uh, and so, for every Rick Keating or David Childs, you'll find an Eric Moss or Frank Gehry. There is, and it's not just a study in oppositions. The opportunities, the breadth of architecture is what makes it incredible. In other words, what can you do, what you can do, in say a half century worth of focusing on one thing. Because wonderfully enough, it's not one thing. And it works for those with a low attention span because you can draw, you can build, you can teach, you can polemicize, you can supervise construction, uh, you can write. Uh, and so whether you do these ser things serially or simultaneously, I think you'll find that the best architects engage in all of it at some point in their career or other. So this is one of those drawings. These projects are, all do have a social dimension. One of the arguments I've always had with Peter Eisenman is, is architecture intrinsic, that is of itself, or extrinsic? This I will admit gladly, all of this work is extrinsically inclined which is about an other, and I'm speaking post-structurally. And that other is an ethical dimension, giving back to society. So, if this works, and it does, oh, but it jumps. These are two um, instrumentations of something for the Art Institute of Chicago. You know, a museum is problematized in that it often talks down to people. And it's basically, look, don't touch. And so I was asked to do something It began for the disabled, but actually to engage, to touch, play with the lights, whatever, of a variety of things to be strewn around the institution. These are two examples of uh, things that you can play around with and, and manipulate out of the archives of the Art Institute that would never find the light of day. And that was interesting to me that you could, that it's something you could, that a museum was interested in breaking down barriers, if you like. This is another of those drawings um, that addresses some projects, some not. And this is much more recent. Uh, as a children's museum in the Museum of Fine Arts in San Juan, Puerto Rico, um, where, let's see, yes where, so I convened um, with interpreters, because I don't unhappily speak Spanish, uh, I convened a group of eight children of the ages that were, were this children's exhibition facility was about, and to see what they wanted. Of course, they wanted, what you see in the middle here, are a series of, um, almost as in a mall, something that they can interact with. So one is a maze, which is, which is here. One are a series of panels, one are computer stations. One is vacant, particularly, uh, consciously, to have the kids do something itself. One is a puzzle, and so forth. And then on the periphery is art, the various kinds of things. Santo, I mean saints, uh, uh, painting, sculpture, modern painting, abstract, representational, and so forth. So here it is, actually, of this is the maze. This is a little tower, which has a tunnel underneath. This is, these are the kids in the maze, throwing stuff up on, you know, on cords strung across, which are their own gym shoes or whatever. And it was, a, it was about interactive issues, because ultimately that's what museology has become. It is not and no longer talking down to people from within the traditions of museums. Here's another one of these drawings. Each project, at the end of each, there'll be these things. Uh, this, there was a philanthropist in Chicago who died recently named Irving Harris, who was probably the greatest friend to African-American preschool kids in the United States. And this was a project that was done some five or six years ago in a very tough part of the city where drive-by shooters, drug dealers, and so forth. And it was a preschool thing um, around an open atrium that kids go out, could go outside and be protected by the building. 
so that drive-by shooters couldn't get at them and so forth. Um, and it was a very interesting operation that spun off with other architects now, doing one in Omaha, one in uh, Milwaukee, and so forth. So it's little schoolhouses, uh, which are individual classrooms and so forth. Uh, that's one image of it with the public housing in the background, now systematically being torn down. Uh, but in any case, uh, there is the, the cloister, the atrium, and the buildings in part anyway. Another drawing of these things, and it says where they're done and when. This is a bit more recent, probably four years old now, is a, um, a building f called the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center, where children, uh, I have to interject here. I, for many years, like, I, like everybody else, I have and had and still have what I would refer to as a conventional practice. I'm in partnership with my wife, Margaret McCurry, and I have over the years done the things that architects do. And then slowly, because I started Archiworks, which at some level, to reiterate and repeat myself or be redundant, has some relationship to this institution, uh, decided, because you can change, uh, that I would no longer do upscale housing. I mean, I had it up to here with what that implies. And so I stopped doing it. And what, what you'll see, uh, there could have been many more projects, is the result of that. My practice now basically is related as is Archiworks to social cause. I couldn't have done Archiworks out of one side of my mouth and do high-end stuff out of the other. So I chugged it. This is Chicago Children's Advocacy Center for kids who are sexually abused, uh, much like that Law and Order Special Victims Program, um, between uh, birth and adolescence, puberty. And this is where they come with their caregivers, their mother, whatever, uh, to be supported by the state's attorney's office. It's a very problematic institution. It has state's attorneys, the police, social workers, uh, a, a clinic run by, the, uh, by Cook County Hospital, uh, and so forth, and the DCFS, Department of Children and Family Services. Um, and so the idea was to try to deinstitutionalize it, because you can imagine what it means to a child who is sexually abused. This is becoming flaccid, Eric. Um, the trauma that that might mean. And so it was important to me to try to introduce, in brackets, playfulness. Um, both in the materials in this glazed brick, uh, in different color glazed brick, and the forms and so forth. So that's what the building looks like. This is one of two cloisters to, again, to protect the kids, as you saw in the other project, from an outside world. Often, the uh, alleged perpetrator comes with the kids or follows the kid. So it's quite dangerous. Then another one of these drawings. And then this is a project for, to hell with it, for, for um, uh, at Northwestern's Block Gallery uh, of drawings made by inmates of concentration camps. And most of those drawings were done very small in a a circumstance of drawing in bed at night without much light and so forth. So they're all very small scale. And what I wanted to do here was to set up a circumstance where a drawing would occupy its own space and the next drawing might be here. And you can anticipate by looking through these apertures, the next one and so forth, but basically, not to do as a maze, but to, to allow, thanks, to allow its own itself to be, I gotta tell you, it's a lot easier just to hold the damn thing, isn't it? I'll try it again. See, that's what I like about 
sack, nothing quite works, <laughs> which is very cool. Um, so it was a very interesting project to me, and that's what it looks like. In other words, that you stop and look at one thing, or you can sit down uh, in various places and look at one drawing alone, not being troubled by the next one. Or you can look through and anticipate what you might see. In other words, showing a great deal of respect to the individual. And again, one of these drawings, uh, which are about concentration camps and exile and a variety of subjects. So this is the beginning. We're doing the Holocaust Museum. You all know that James Inglefried passed away recently, who was the author, the architect of the Holocaust Museum in Washington. We're doing the one in Illinois. And it's a very difficult project in the sense that there are different kinds of constituents. There are the survivors, the Holocaust survivors themselves, which are my age and older, so they're dying off. Uh, then there are their descendants and so forth. So there are very, and the descendants as American Jews tend to not be as tough as the survivors themselves. So, but my, my building is about the survivors and it's done for them. That building, uh, we began in, in 2000 and it goes out to bid in April, May. So it goes on to construction in June, July. And it began with a series of drawings, one of which is shown here, but then for the actual project began this way. Um, there was an interview process and I didn't want to do that, but Margaret said that I should do it. And on a plane, on the letter that I was asked to do it, I made some sketches. And basically, it was about, this is actually reversed, um, it was about the two orientations in Judaism. Because one thing about the Holocaust and what the Third Reich finally came to in the final solution at that villa in Wannsee, outside of Berlin, um, that a movie was made of, was they were not only attempting to destroy ultimately the six million Jews and others as well, um, but actually to destroy the history of Judaism, which is rooted in two circumstances which have two different orientations. One, like the American Indian, the Egyptians, is oriented to East as any sun culture, agriculture, uh, organi uh, culture is about. Uh, with the rising sun and the crops and so forth. The other, almost as a post-structuralist religion, as is Islam, is that its significant other is located elsewhere. So if you're Islamic, you will orient yourself toward Mecca. And for the Jews, you will orient yourself toward where uh, the Temple Mount is. So that location via Skokie, just out of Chicago, uh, where this is, will be built shortly, uh, is east, east, southeast, about eight degrees east, east, southeast of that site. And so these two orientations represent a cleave with a focus, focal area. And the one, you enter into the dark building and descend into darkness, which is the, what transpired, the core itself the knuckle is a, um, the book of remembrance, and then you ascend into the white building as an education center. And that's basically the proposition. So these were early sketches of it, including, again, the concentration camp. And that was the first drawing. This is before I was commissioned, actually, of the two buildings and the book of remembrance as the cleat. That's basically the part T and it's been elaborated upon somewhat dramatically. Now what happens here? No one knows. So who is technically proficient with this stuff? It went black, then what? These are actually the slides. I know, see, but they're all black.
See, this is what you would be looking at. Yeah. And you go back one for sure, it's there. I think. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Give it one more second. Can you start there? No, we have to go back some. Can you go back? Yeah. Or is it going to be black? It seems like there's a series of slides that don't That are missing. Okay, then we'll start here. It's okay. Okay. So these are study models uh, early on uh, that are, they're, they're fine. So this, you enter into the one building, which is the, the dark building, and everything is one way. You enter into that building, and Christ, I think we're going to miss the plans. And the, the Book of Remembrance is here, and then you ascend into the light building. These are um, evacuated, as you'll see. Uh, the columns described in 1 Kings 5 through 9 uh, of uh, the first temple, Solomon, so-called Solomon's temple, as an ameliorative move between the Canaanites and the Israelites. And uh, so they're evacuated via the temple that Herod produced. This is looking down at that study model. This is the basically looking down at the plan at a much earlier stage. And I have a feeling that we missed the plans, but be that as it may. Um, so you basically come in in one side, put your coats up in the mechanical device here, go through the whole operation, come out the other side, get your coats on this side and leave. So it's one way. I remember years ago, I did a studio um, at Houston, at uh, University of Houston, where I did a project uh, for a circus that you went in as the observer and came out the performer. In other words, there's an epiphany. One of the terrific things about this building, this building, is that you don't a priori go out the way that you came in. But conventionally, most every building, you go in, do what you do, uh, uh, circulate, get a sense of the spatiality, and come out the same way. So in other words, you go in reverse. And it's not to create an epiphany for those that are coming here, but there is a very tough story about a descent into darkness with the exhibitions and the uh, uh, death camp buildings, the Book of Remembrance, and then actually rising in this white side into uh, basically an education center. And there are other things. I mean, the, the exhibition begins at these apertures. This is crystal knocked and so forth. And on this side is a library. And it's about education. Uh, and this shows it with the trusses, the bowstring trots, the other truss, the um, uh, purlins and so forth. So you see a kind of level of complexity. I'm sorry the plans aren't there, but this begins to show, albeit an earlier iteration, what I was trying to accomplish. And that's basically what the building is. So that at an even earlier study model, not study model, finished model, but of an earlier, slightly earlier iteration, that's the building with this uh, performance hall in there, the Book of Remembrance, back of the house and so forth. So these are an anodized black building, an anodized white building. So these are images of that, uh, different ways of looking at it. And then the most recent renderings show various views with really about the landscape. So that this is in daytime in summer of that entrance view and then nighttime in winter. So this is another iteration of that. The, this is an outside element for the what's so-called righteous, who, uh, other than Jews, Indians, Christians, Muslims, who actually helped save Jews during the Holocaust. So this is the summer daytime view and the winter nighttime view. Similarly, on the white side where you exit the building, the summer daytime view and the winter nighttime view. And they're not pretty plant materials, 
they're, they're, they're relatively authentic, I mean, in the sense of a certain kind of rugged uh, landscape at some level. This is the view on the uh, wall of the righteous, again in the summer and the daytime, and then in the winter at night or at dusk. So that's that project. The plans are missing. Sorry, what can I say? Um, and then another of these drawings. Then this, we have another project. We're doing three projects simultaneously. One that I just couldn't put together enough visuals on, which is the National Training Center for the Bricklayers Union in between Washington, D.C. and Annapolis. I'm now, I'm 75 years old. I really much prefer to work at home. I have no idea how Frank and others can do the level of travel that they do. It's tough enough to come here for a four-hour flight from Chicago, and yet you're coming from London. So I like working at home. This is um, the Pacific Garden Mission, which is the largest shelter for homeless people in Chicago. It's been there 127 years. Some of you old enough will remember the name Billy Sunday, I think, a former ball player and a evangelist who was one of the founders of it. This is an interesting story. Obviously, I can't name names here. Um, the site that they're at now has been coveted by a high school in Chicago, public high school called Jones High School. And they had, uh, the high school gave their architect to the mission. It's called the Pacific Garden Mission to work on a series of sites because Jones High School coveted the land, wanted to inhabit it, but then there had to be a place because you can't evict, uh, although they didn't sense it at the time. Somehow I knew it when it came to me. Uh, in Illinois, you can't use the power of eminent domain against a religious institution. In any case, the institution asked its architect, a major corporate firm in Chicago, to represent them in court against the city. The architect turned them down, which I personally find shocking. I mean, I think, you know, one of the great things about SciArc, it flies in the face of the profession, say, NCR, BACSA, frankly, registration, um, and so forth. And some years ago, it, um, some of you may recall, but in any case, whether you do or not, in, it began in Chicago. Um, there was a price-fixing lawsuit against the American Institute of Architects because one of Skidmore's partners, Tom Ironman, was not trying to regulate fees, but trying to suggest typologically what fees might be in terms of both the type and the scale of project. Uh, the AI caved because it's what it does best. And the result is, if you look on the website today, you are now allowed to displace another architect without letting he or she know. You're allowed to uh, undercut fees and so forth. But I'm an old guy, and when I started in architecture, it just wasn't that way. So we were then asked to testify, and I agreed I would. The result is, net result is, we became the architect. And of course, I notified the other architect, who I've yet to hear from. In any case, the project, which is a vast, it's 150,000 square feet, um, for both men, women, and children, as you'll see, segregated and controlled and so forth, uh, of homeless people. And it can sleep 1,000 people a night. It provides. 32,000 pieces of clothing a month. It uh, feeds, I don't know, it's three different sittings per meal, two for male populations. Obviously, male homeless is five times bigger than female and children. And so it's a huge institution. This was an early, this is the model that we did that we presented to Mayor Daly, who, I don't know about your mayor, I don't really don't, I'm not up to date with what's going on in LA, but in Chicago, Richie Daly, Richard M. Daly, is a spectacular mayor in the sense that he is way ahead of the curve on uh, sustainable architecture, on environmental and ecological responsibility. Uh, in Chicago, you now, you, this year is the last year that you can build 
without having a lead a, a building that you do as being lead certified, yet alone silver, gold, or platinum. So he, his interest is in that area. And that's extraordinary for a mayor to be so hands-on about such a phenomenon. So we showed him this, I showed him this project, and he loved it. Uh, it's changed somewhat, as you'll see. Basically, these are greenhouses on the roof and uh, PV cells, and it's oriented to, in, to itself in an outside cloister stepped back at three different levels to protect the homeless from the general population. I mean, you may see it as civilians, as homeless of being, say, aggressive panhandlers. But imagine what it is to be homeless and to have somebody have localized amnesia to pretend that you don't exist. So my heart really went out to them. This is evangelically run, and it is a fabulous project. This next image was, this has gone very quickly, where we worked on the Holocaust for six years, and it goes under construction in May, June. This we've worked on a year and a half, and it goes under construction in May, June. Um, we found that we couldn't afford this. I mean, we're talking, this, all of this has to be done for about $150 a square foot, which is really more or less like this building, very tough. So it changed. This was an earlier iteration. This was yet, this was a somewhat later one. With the cloister. And this is what it is now. Wait, what happened? This is the roof plan on the site plan. The greenhouses are now on the south. This is all a green roof, sedum and so forth. And these are the cells. The cloister is there. There's a small chapel oriented correctly coming in from the west, if you remember Cistercian monastic life. Um, but this is the ground floor. It's a very simple building. It's a virtually 20 by 20 bay, concrete uh, structural bay. It has sort of a yellow brick road. Um, and the female and children coming here, the males coming here is obviously a control point. Um, there's an auditorium. They do a program called Unshackle, which is broadcast. It has been for ever, for I don't know how many decades, all over the world in eight languages. So the auditorium is there. What we've provided that they never had, mostly the homeless would come in and sit. And I mean just sit in here on a cold day. Um, you know, better to be, if you're going to be homeless, this is the place, not Chicago. Chicago is pretty tough to be homeless in. But what, I, what they didn't have room to do, though they somehow ad hoc were trying, was to develop um, both pastorally as well as um, educationally, as well as the ministry, uh, doing GED courses, teaching them how to write checks and so forth. So what we've done now is to do transient women and children's space here, transient men here. So they don't look out at the women who look out this way. And this is so that there can be coursework, that there are seminar rooms and counseling rooms, yet alone sitting and watching TV or just staying warm uh, for both of them. The, uh, then they have another, so that at one level it's for transients. They accept everyone and they treat everyone as guests. I'm using their language, not mine. And they approach homelessness with immense respect. Um, so then they have what are called program people, men and women, who can stay there up to a year. It is not soup for Jesus. This is actually where they're not paid, but they have three squares and a place to sleep every night. So the program male population is here. The dining hall is here serving three meals per each of, of three servings of each of three meals a day uh, with kitchen and so forth. All the stuff comes in here, the elevator down to the basement, up to the floors, a loading dock here, and minimum parking. So, but there's, it's, it's a very big building. Second floor are the women who come up these stairs and are behind a secured area here. The elevator is here. So the public space is here with security at that point and the woman's facility, the, the uh, auditorium is double height space. The women's facility is here 
which is daytime educational and ministry stuff here with classrooms, the director, counseling, and so forth. And then staff women, program women without children, program women with children, uh, transient, well, no, transient women with children, program women, and transient women without children. But they all have access to a balcony, which is behind an outdoor terrace, basically virtually 20 feet wide, with um, uh, opening here, but then a wall here. This is for a rail only, so the men can't be catcalling the women and so forth. These are three men's dorms with their associated johns, what's called a hot box, which is where their clothes are brought up to 180 degrees, free to vermin and so forth. Going back to the ground floor, the cloister is here with the chapel coming in from the west, properly oriented. Um, 12 trees, 12 lights, 12 more lights, based on 12 apostles, the 12 tribes, and so forth. The greenhouses are here with a men's greenhouse, women's greenhouse, prep area, and out to both where the, they'll probably be growing. There's a gorilla gardener in Chicago who is going to be running this, a woman who's both an artist and a gardener, who's had his third generation, largest nursery in Chicago family. Um, so on Saturdays, there'll be a farmer's market here, and the produce that they make, which will probably be niche market herbs for the vast number of ethnic restaurants in Chicago until the Canadians find out and undercut them, and then they have to go on to something else, whatever. That's a whole story all by itself. That's the second floor. The third floor, this, this is the green roof, and then the greenhouse is down here. This is staff and program male population, all of this, okay, behind a wall. So they have terraces as well. So it's a very interesting proposition. We're trying to, we're doing the greenhouses because it gives them another opportunity to engage in a trade, if you will. Um, so they're not just, if they get a job, they're not just flipping burgers at McDonald's. Uh, and then the core and uh, the cells and so forth. And then the basement, which there is a woman's portion and a men's portion of the core that comes here. So the women, I didn't actually show it. Uh, on the third, second and third floor, there are men and women's gyms to get them up to speed, spas in a way. And down here are, with all the things you might imagine, is a salon for the women, which I think is somewhere here. For the men, a barber shop, which is something here. And all the stuff, the food that is given to them, goes into coolers and freezers, function, okay? The sections are here, so you see it terracing back in various, it's between a two and three story building. The greenhouses are somewhere here, on the south. And the elevations, it's infill brick, glass, concrete frame, period. Actually, the price come in on Friday morning, so that should be going back tomorrow. Be interesting. So this is actually what the building is now, okay? As it's done, we're taking the sign that exists, the archaeological sign, uh, with a uh, flashing light that says, Jesus saves, and so forth. It, it's all existing, so you see, but you get a sense of this anyway, the loading dock, the parking, whatever it is, and the greenhouses the green roof and so forth. And then the cloister with the chapel facing on the cloister itself and then the setbacks stepping back. But it gives them an out of door place that is solely theirs. And having the farmer's market on Saturday is a way of breaking down barriers between a civilian population and people that they have, they basically have shown no respect for or interest in. Another one of these drawings and then finally, I want to end with Archie Works. You know, there's, I think, six, there are four or five students now. Actually, I spent a couple hours with four of them this afternoon. And Eric has been fabulous at admitting them into this program. And they've all, they're all very different, as you are different from each other. And they are, too. And they've all done well and thrived here.